Okay, so we've talked about what stars are, but now we should get on at least a little bit to the vexed question of what we call them. Well, look, I mean, that's kind of the important part to some people, right? Because that's how they have a relationship with the stars. Uh, and in fact, lots of different people and cultures have relationships with the stars, and even the same stars. Yes, I mean, when I'm out with non-astronomers and people say, what stars? They don't care about, I mean, I'd like to tell them what it's made out of, how it's powered by nuclear fusion, but they don't care about what it's called. <laughs> and of course, what it's called depends on which culture you're coming from, the, the Chinese or the Arabic or the Aboriginal Australian or the European names for these things. Yep. It's telling you about us, not about the stars. That's right. And I guess that's what people often is are attracted to looking up, is that connection to the stars themselves, right? So they want to know uh, what its name and is it special? Has someone seen it before? It's that really human connection. Yeah, and it's not really astronomy, but I think we would better talk about yeah. it a little bit, otherwise I'm sure you, uh, dear listeners, will murder us for not talking about the really important things. So, I mean, the brighter stars have got names in almost every culture. That's right. So here we've got, for example, Orion, the great hunter, which is actually a hunter in many different cultures. It is, that's right. It's quite common. There's, there's lots of stories in, in Aboriginal groups that are talking about this set of stars being a hunter and chasing around. So it's kind of even nice that even the, the story of the stars themselves sometimes have relations. And we've got, for example, the star up here. This is a Betelgeuse. It's my, my favorite one because it's the one we all want to blow up, but probably won't anytime soon, but I can hope at least. Yes, these supernova people, all they care about is destroying stars. <laughs> um, and the name that we in the Westerners use is actually the Arabic name, That's Betelgeuse. Right. And in fact, most of the bright stars, because they were named by the um, Arabic scientists around 1000 AD, and we've inherited their names. That's right. So all these lovely lyrical Arabic names for these things. Um, and then we've got Sirius, the brightest star in the sky, and Procyon, all these sort of names. It's a, mix, a mixed bag of Arabic names and Greek and Roman names and so on like this. But other cultures have different names. There'll be different Chinese names and Indian and so on. And, and so I guess, Paul, the question is, how do we officially have a name of a star? Yes, I mean, if every, 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 every different country has a different um, language, a yeah. different name for it, and that's perfectly fine. You just might want to translate it. Mm. But for astronomers, we probably want something a bit more systematic. That's for the right. really bright stars, uh, let's say a Chinese astronomer wants to talk to an Aboriginal astronomer, to an English astronomer, how do they know they're talking about the same star? Exactly. And so, and also, only the really brightest stars have names. I mean, that one, you've got Betelgeuse, that's you've right. got Rigel and Sirius, but you know that one over there? I'm yes, not... right, yeah, all of these in the back don't have names. So how do you know when I say, hey, I found something interesting with that star, that I tell you the right star name instead of just whatever name I made up. So the first convention was came up with a German astronomer called Bayer back in the 1600s. And basically it said that the brightest, divide the sky up into constellations. Yes. And these are the European constellations, That's which right. actually go all the way back to ancient Babylon. So they're not European in their origin. But um, the Europeans still took credit for it since the Yes, <laughs> and the brightest star in a particular constellation will be called Alpha and the name of the constellation. So here we have Orion, and the brightest yep. one in Orion is Betelgeuse, which will be called Alpha Orionis. So, so Alpha is the brightest star in that constellation in number one. So the number two is Beta Orionis. Yes, so Rigel is Beta Orionis. Yep. Uh, for example, this uh, Sirius is in the constellation of the big dog, That's right. Canis Major. So this would be also known as Sirius Alpha Canis Majoris. That's right. And Procyon's in the little dog, so it's Alpha Canis Binaurus. And then so do we just go down the Greek alphabet? Yeah, and that gets you up to the first, I don't know how many letters are on the Greek alphabet, yeah. 20 or so, not quite as many as the Roman alphabet. Yep. So that gets you a few more stars, but it's still nothing like to, enough to handle all these things. That's right, yeah, I mean, because I would feel like even in this pocket, there's going to be more of 20. Yeah, so the next list was, um, I was uh, normally ascribed to the English astronomer Flamsteed, um, and they basically they took all the stars in a given constellation, numbered them, not by brightness, but in order across the sky. Wait, which order? Right ascension order. Oh, it's okay. basically longitude on the sky. Okay. Now, this is a very dubious way to do things because. Um, there are a lot more stars than he could see. So basically it was stars bright enough for to be seen back then in order, and they'd be called one Orionis, two Orionis, and a lot of stars, not quite the very brightest, but the next rung down are called like 55 Cancri or something. That's that right. This would be the 55th star in right ascension order across Cancer. And interesting, this is almost exactly the same as what the Chinese, as they're naming, they had the uh, 
uh, their constellations and they numbered things within them. So most things in Chinese have a name which is the number of for the Chinese constellation which is not quite the same as the Western constellation. Yep. So that gets you maybe a few hundred stars but it still doesn't get you anything like the one thing that's troubling me, though, Paul, is in some of these cases, so if we take the, the handle uh, of the uh, saucepan, as we call it here in Australia, uh, or the Sword of Orion, that's not a star, though. Yes, so um, fuzzy things are usually named by the catalogue of fuzzy things. Oh, okay. So the most famous catalogue of fuzzy things is the Messier catalogue. That's right. Um, nothing to do with actually being messy, it's just the name <laughs> of the French astronomer working in Paris who observed these things. And they were looking for planets, and the way you'd find a planet as opposed to a star is it would look extended. That's right. And they kept finding extended things that didn't move, and he'd wanted not to mistake them for planets, so just came a catalogue of, this is a fuzzy thing that doesn't move, it's not a planet, ignore it. All right. So the fuzzy things have got that. But that also works for stars. For a lot of the stars, they just have a catalogue number. Oh, At okay. some point historically, someone, um, would have come up with a catalogue of stars and it would have just been the number in the catalogue. So, so let's say you came up with a catalogue um, and it with the 10,000 stars, it might be Tucker 4,653, which would mean it's the 4,000 whatever hundred star in the Tucker catalogue of stars. But how do you know that what catalogue star that number is? Well, if you, you'd go back and look at the original paper where the catalogue was published and it would tell you the coordinates on the sky, the longitude and latitude, the right ascension and declination. So, so by creating this table of the, my name, whatever I want, and its position, then you say, OK, well, Tucker 486 uh, is right there. That's right. And that's another way you can number it, is just by coordinates on the sky. So you could say it's star 2138 minus 4434. It's actually a quasar. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm sure you knew that one on purpose. <laughs> um, not a star, but... N n An object in the sky. And that's actually a very useful way to catalogue something, because it, you could then go and point your telescope at it, because you'll know its mm. coordinates on the sky and find it. And it's unambiguous. It doesn't depend on uh, which catalogue it works on. That's right. And if you tell it to someone else, you immediately know, oh, that's in that part of the sky. Oh, I can't see it yet. I have to wait. And that's also another benefit. If you say HR 486, uh, I don't know, is that up? Is it, is, is it visible now? Do I have to wait three months' time? Whereas at least with the coordinates, you can know when and where it is pretty much exactly. Just as if you say, go to this house. It's the blue house on Amber Street. Okay, great. Which yes. one is that? You know, But you know, in this suburb, this city, this address, this GPS location, then I can find it. Yeah, so I think it's much like houses. I mean, a, a very famous house might get, you know, like Parliament House in that's Canberra. Right. You know, there's only one Parliament House in Canberra, and that's, that'll be like the, the Beetlejuice that's or the right. Sirius. Those that actually have a name that everyone understands. And then for the average typical one, it's like you know, 55 Cancri or Epsilon Eridani or something like this, and that would right. be like your know, number seven Lonsdale Street or exactly. something like this. That's right. Um, but then that's still not very useful, especially if it's an address in... Uh, rural Africa that I'm not familiar with, yep. and you might just say it's latitude this, longitude so and so, and that's then I right. could go onto Google Earth and find out where it is and say, oh, it's something like that. That's unambiguous, but it's also it's not a very useful name. It's not very romantic. Well, I think, and, and this is always the question we get when we, we always say, hey, there's a new discovery. We found the most metal poor star, this planet, and it's J234558 minus 620619. That's a different to Aegean. Uh, <laughs> that, that doesn't sound nice. So maybe we should give them all names. The trouble is, you know, the, just the number of stars in our galaxy is a, uh, you know, that's the 30 or 40 stars for every person on Earth. So that's a lot of naming. Yeah, I mean, if you try just randomly assigning letters, sort of AAAA, AAAB, or something like this, there aren't enough words in the English language for the stars in the universe. That's right. Um, so, and anyway, who could remember it? Let's say someone said it was R R A A A B B C C. You'd still have to go to a catalogue and look that up and find out the coordinates, what type of star it is. You you know, no one's going to remember those it, things. So just by telling you the coordinates in the beginning, you kind of already know what's going on. Yes. So I, I guess there's a, a sort of compromise here. The stars that people care about, which is the very bright ones that you can see, or maybe a star that's too faint to see, but it's really interesting because there's a cool planet around it, yep. or it's about to explode or something, will have common names as well as their coordinates. But most stars, I mean, nowadays, realistically, most stars are going to look up with a guy, a catalogue number. Exactly. So I guess then the question is, if, if, if it doesn't really matter, uh, and some of these names are boring, and okay, well, we all agree, Beetlejuice, that has a name, that's great. But that star, that's, you know, long telephone number name, why can't I just... I really care about that star. Can I, can I name that? What does it matter? 
Well, I suppose you can, but who else is going to know that you've named it? Mm. I mean, if someone else discovers it in, uh, in India five years from now or is studying it, they won't know that you chose to give it a name. They won't care. They will probably look up catalogues to make by coordinate to make sure no one else has studied it before to use the data. But I think what we're really thinking about here is maybe people are going to be living there and exploring these things. Mm. I mean, remember, whenever people first explore a new country, they often get names. That's right. Like the first uh, European explorers in Australia would often ask the locals what something was called, and the locals would normally reply with, I do not understand what the hell you're talking about, moron, yeah. in the Aboriginal language, and that would be the name <laughs> of the thing now. So, but often people name things after themselves. So, oh, for yes. example, Captain Cook sailed down the east coast of Australia and named every mountain and valley they saw after someone on his crew. And so we've got Batemans Bay and all these different places which are all named after crew members. Yep. Or first Australian Governor Macquarie named everything after himself. So there's Macquarie River and Macquarie <laughs> Mountain and Macquarie Bay and Macquarie Harbour, Port Macquarie and so on, all the way up and down. Um, I suppose you can do that for us. If you're the first person to discover these things, you name it. But then it's just so many. I get, and that's the thing, right? If you're looking at purposely old stars, you find so many of them, it's, it's actually preoccupying. And then you have to think of the name, and then you have to tell people the name, and then... You have to get them to use it. And then you have to get them to use it. And that's probably the hardest part, because, again, unless it's for some reason special, and it does, it does happen, and there are special things, it's a little bit cumbersome to do all this. And look, there have been names designated to bright stars named after important or famous people. There have actually some of the southern constellations have had aboriginal names granted to them or, you know, saying by the International Astronomical Union, this is its name now. But those are still only the brightest stars that may have some meaning. For the rest of it, it's, it's cumbersome almost. Where this becomes very dubious is there are companies that will sell you a name of a star. They will get right. to claim, we will name the star after you. And they will say, yes, this name will get inscribed in a book and that book will go to the Library of Congress or something. But realistically, no one's ever going to look up that book in the Library of Congress. Let's say you discover a supernova behind that star or something, it becomes interesting. You're not even going to know that some company 20 years ago sold it to somebody. It's not official in any way, shape or That's form. Right. Uh, you're just going to name it by its coordinates. And if it becomes famous, it might be called Brad Supernova or something like this. And I guess that's the other thing is, you know, because no one else knows it, you actually get multiple companies selling the same star because either they don't know that someone else has bought it or they don't really care, probably the latter. And so they could just sell it again. In fact, in some cases, I actually have seen someone come to me and two different people were sold the same star by the same company. Yes, so fairly dubious. So if someone's trying to sell you a star, don't buy it. It's nothing official. Um, for naming stars, most stars just have catalogue numbers because there are just so many of them. We haven't got enough imagination to come up with names for these things. Yeah. The only ones that have names are the really bright or famous ones. Yeah. And that name will vary from culture to culture and country to country. There is an International Astronomical Union standard just so if you want to talk to someone from another culture, yeah. there's a constant way of spelling it and you can look it up and work out what coordinate it corresponds to. And this problem slightly actually even extends to planets around other stars, exoplanets, because once you find a planet around that star, well... You call it, you know, HR167B, and then HR167C. And at some point, should humans ever settle that planet, I'm sure they'll come up with a better name for but it. But until then, you just, there's too much time, and at least I know when you say HR167C, I can look, look up, up the HR star. HR catalogue and find out the coordinates and point your telescope at it. And I know it's the second planet. <laughs>